this is what we intend to cover. Uh, we'll just go through some introduction, an overview of the anatomy and the epidemiology. Um, we'll go through the presentation, the investigations, what are our treatment options, prognosis, and then finally, what do we take away from this? Are we just doing this as an academic practice or is there something that we can actually change in our practice? So, developmental dysplasia of the hip, the biggest word here that we need to just deal with is dysplasia because it will define a lot of what we'll be talking about. And a simple description from the dictionary is an abnormal growth or abnormal development of any tissue or, or organ. In this particular case, we are talking we are talking about, um, in this particular case, we'll be talking about the hip. So we'll be talking about the congenital, uh, I mean, we'll be talking about the hip dysplasia. There used to be a term that would be called congenital hip dysplasia or congenital dislocation of the hip. We have since moved from that term because congenital dislocation of the hip would automatically imply that all these patients, their problems started before birth. But as you're going to see shortly, not all of them start before birth. Some of them actually start after birth. It's a condition that has been treated for long. Hippocrates started treating it um, long before any documentation of this was done. An Italian pediatrician called Otolan in 1900s documented treatment of the same. Galeazzi did research on over 2,000 cases of the same. So it's something that has been treated for long. And essentially what uh, DDH, I'll now start using the abbreviation, and essentially what DDH is, it's an abnormality around the hip. So we have an abnormality of the head of the femur, the acetabulum, and the soft tissues around it, which are the labrum and the capsule. And the most important thing that you want to pick from this presentation is that early diagnosis is key. Because once we have the early diagnosis, we can be able to sort out a lot of things um, in advance. There is a spectrum in this developmental dysplasia of the hip. And when you just follow it, it's, it follows rather logically. One, you have the abnormal development of the hip. Some of them go into subluxation, if it worsens, some of them go into dislocation. And our focus of our discussion today will be on three, these three main ones. But then you can have more. There are some that are actually born with the dislocations and many of them tend to have something else going on, mainly neuromuscular diseases, things like atherogryposis, they will be born with the dislocation already on. But then there are a few that may develop way later, the adolescent dysplasia, and I'm only making a mention of it now, but my main focus is on what happens um, in childhood. Uh, dislocation tends to be seen more rarely than dysplasia because many of the patients that have dysplasia actually resolve over time. We tend to see it more in females than in males, and we'll be talking about why in a short while. And we tend to see it more on the left side than on the right side. Uh, about a quarter of them, 20 to 25 percent of them, will be bilateral. Why more of the left and on the right? If we remember back our days in obstetrics, we remember something that used to be called a left occipital anterior position that many of the babies are in when they're intrauterine, and that tends to put pressure on the left hip and forces the left hip to stay, the left yeah, thigh and hip to stay adducted. And that continuous adduction uh, predisposes the hip to um, a dislocation. There are known risk factors, one of them being an intrauterine position that is abnormal, breach being the commonest. The female gender is more, we find it more commonly affected because female babies or female fetuses will respond to the maternal relaxing hormones, um, relaxing. Those of you who may have had the privilege of being pregnant or being around a pregnant woman for a while will notice that at some point during pregnancy, they're able to put their, they're able to sit in very strange positions that they could not sit before, sit with the legs crossed um, because of this relaxing hormone. The same hormone tends to work on the babies and cause this excessive relaxation of uh, ligaments. And because of that, they are more prone to the dislocation. A uterus that has not been stretched before in firstborns, or a uterus that is not stretched adequately, like in oligohydramnios, 
causes uh, that crowding and you end up with um, higher risk of, of, of DDH. There is this practice of swaddling babies. Um, it has been more common in the West and especially the Nordic countries, uh, the Mongolians and the like. And the picture that you see on the bottom, bottom right there is something they used to call, I think, a cradle carrier or something like that. And they would wrap babies around that way and carry them around, I guess, all through the day. And because of this adapted position, they tend to stand a higher risk of developing a hip dysplasia or even just going on with dislocations. There is one Samzungu who came uh, to Kijabe when I was working there and he said that this condition is extremely rare in Africans. In fact, it is almost never seen. And I guess the biggest reason is this, that many of us as Africans carry our babies at the back and the children are forced to stay in a position where the hips are abducted. And so even if maybe we missed a, 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 we missed a DDH at birth at the time of screening, then the mothers help us and fix it back. And so we tend to see it less commonly in Africans and especially in communities that carry their babies at the back uh, than in the other communities that tend to carry their babies uh, in this sort of position. And then as I had already mentioned, neuromuscular conditions, especially arthrogryposis, tends to also lead to a dislocation around the time of birth. And unfortunately, these are among the most difficult ones to reduce, whether you're planning to do surgery or not. Um, so let's go through what happens in the anatomy and the physiology. And my biggest uh, focus is on the anatomy. And we'll just be following sequentially what seems to happen. So you have a baby who is born with an unstable hip. It can dislocate, it can go back. Because of the recurrent dislocation and uh, reduction, you end up with a dysplasia. We know that hips or all joints will develop well when there's a congruent reduction. And so when the hip is going in and out and in and out, you start ending up with abnormalities in how the acetabulum is forming and how the head is forming. And so you end up with the dysplasia. From the dysplasia, this re it results in now a repetitive subluxation and or dislocation. The continuous injury on the lip of the acetabulum will result in this limbus formation, which is the thickening of that uh, lip of the acetabulum. And because of that, you end up with the hip now no longer reducing and you now result in the chronic dislocation. The consequences of the chronic dislocation, we'll look at it uh, in two ways. There is a consequence to the soft tissues and there is a consequence to the bony uh, tissues. When the hip is out, the body does not know how to take care of empty spaces or the body doesn't like empty spaces. And so you end up with this pulvina uh, that forms within the acetabulum. It's a thick, fatty, tissue that forms within the acetabulum to basically occupy the space that was occupied by the head before. Because the head is sitting out, obviously the ligamentum ter teres becomes long and so you end up with this elongated ligamentum teres. Um, because the transverse acetabular ligament is no longer containing the bottom of the acetabulum and containing the bottom of the head, it now has the freedom to thicken. And so you end up with a thickening of the transverse acetabular ligament. And then finally, this position of the iliopsoas tendon, which in a reduced hip should be more medial to the acetabulum, now it starts crossing right across the acetabulum and right across the uh, capsule. And because of that, you end up with a capsule narrowing at the center and you end up with this hourglass shape. These are the things that we now call the blocks to a reduction. So because of all these tissues that has formed in the joint, the narrowing of the space within the joint, this uh, capsule that is being uh, constricted, you cannot now reduce a joint, uh, the hip easily. And then what happens to the bones? Um, as I mentioned, a normal hip development depends on a congruent hip in there, a congruent head in the socket. And so because of the head being out, the acetabular floor starts thickening and obviously it, shall, it makes the acetabulum shallow. There's a flattening of the acetabulum, so you no longer have the hemisphere that is there. You have the flattening because it's no longer being shaped the right way. You have an, ante, an, an, an acetabular interversion and 
many of the children will also develop this antiversion on the femur and some of them also get an increased neck shaft angle. When you look at this normal hip on the right, compared with the hip that is on the left, you end up with those uh, abnormalities. Other things that may be seen, which are, you can see obviously here, is that there is even a reduction in the size of the ossified part of the head. And so you have this almost non-existent head. In fact, in, in, in younger x-rays, I remember a patient who once came and told me, Dr. Ali Mwambia, I guess it's because they had done an x-ray too early. So you don't end up with a normal formation of the head. Yeah. How do the children present? The best presentation is at birth. And we wish that all of them would present to us at birth. And the only way that they can present at birth is if we can find ways of screening. Unfortunately, the Americans and the people out there are saying from their studies that screening for developmental dysplasia of the hip seems not to make a big difference in the outcome. In a study that was published in 2006, this was their conclusion. But I want us to mark the words that I have underlined. That screening with clinical examination, let's keep the part of the ultrasound, can identify newborns at an increased risk of DDH. So whether or not it makes a big difference to them, I have a strong feeling that it would make a big difference to us. And I'm going to review, I'm going to come back to this slide, or at least to this discussion at the end of my presentation, so that we can have something to take home to see what can we change in our practice that can help us to identify these children with the DDH earlier, and hopefully um, avoid ending up with children who present to us at five years or 10 years or 15 years is the case may be sometimes. So if we have children who are presenting at less than three months, how can we identify that they have a developmental dysplasia of the hip? And our mainstay, uh, our main test at this age is what we call the Ballos test. And I'll be showing a video in a short while. When I was a resident, I used to find one simple way of remembering the Ballos and the Autolanis test because both of them are testing for the hip, whether it is dislocated or reduced. And so because Autolani starts with an O, then I would know that Autolani test is done on a hip that is out, starting with an O. That obviously, then the Ballos test would be done on a hip that is in. And so in the Ballos test, we start with a hip that is currently in the joint, and that's why we are talking of patients below three months, because they are not chronically dislocated. And from there, um, you try to uh, you adduct the hip and put up uh, backward pressure and that should dislocate the hip. In an autolani test, because the hip is already dislocated, it is out, O and O, then you would abduct the hip and put some upward pressure on the greater trochanter and that would reduce the hip. And there would be this click that you can feel going in or going, I mean going out and going in. The Galdiazi, the Galdiazi test is basically a test to see shortening and so you can see in this case the left hip or the left uh, thigh looks shorter than the, than the right and that is a Galdiazi test, that would be a positive Galdiazi test. Let's briefly look at what, how to do the Barlow's and Dr. Lange. Assess the hips one at a time using two maneuvers. In the Barlow maneuver, first We are not getting you, Levis. Adduct the hip by bringing the thigh toward. In the Ortolani maneuver, flex the infant's knees to a 90 degree position. <clears throat>
Thank you. Um, Dr. Kilonzo, please tell me, is this around the time when I disappeared? Uh, slightly behind. Slightly behind. I'm sorry about minutes. our... Why yes, there. Yeah. yeah, okay. So uh, I was saying that uh, for presentation, the best presentation would be at birth. But we know that this is not always possible. And so I was saying that we will be discussing at the end how can we change our practice so that we ensure that we're able to catch most of these patients. The Americans and the people in the West uh, have told us that from other studies that it doesn't seem to make a big difference in the outcomes, whether or not we do screening at birth. But then in this paper that was presented in, two, that was published in 2006, I want us to pick what I've underlined in red for ourselves, that screening with clinical examination can identify newborns that are at increased risk of DDH. And because we know it can do that, it means that we can intervene early. Because those of you who have seen children with DDH, we have so many of them that present at a walking age, at five years, at 12 years, and some of them we are left with no option but to leave them alone. And so we'll be having a short discussion at the end on how we can help change this. And so when you have a child presenting at less than three years, uh, let's remember the Ballos and Otolani's test. The Ballos test is for a hip that is in and can be, re can, it is in that can be dislocated. And as I was saying earlier, as a resident, I used to remember the Otolani test starts with an O and out starts with an O. So Otolani test is for a hip that is out. You abduct the hip and put pressure on the greater trochanter and that should reduce the hip. The Galeazzi test is to look at the leg, leg length difference and so you can see there is a shortened uh, left as compared to the right. And so briefly look at these two tests. Assess the hips one at a time using two maneuvers. In the Barlow maneuver, first adduct the hip by bringing the thigh toward the midline. Then apply a gentle posterior pressure to the knee. In the Ortolani maneuver, flex the infant's knees to a 90 degree position then abduct the legs by folding the thigh outwards. Okay. But then some of the children don't present at three months. They'll present way later. And the biggest thing that we'll notice at that time is a discrepancy in the link length. There is something called a classic test, which when you put a finger, an index finger at the anterior superior iliac spine and another finger, preferably the long finger, at the greater trochanter, the line between those two should point at the umbilicus. In the case where there is a, the hip is dislocated, then you will notice that the line does not point at the umbilicus, it will be pointing lower. And that will be the classic test. It's more beneficial when you're having a patient who has a bilateral dislocation, because in those ones you may not see the limb length discrepancy. Above 12 months, above a year, there'll be a pelvic obliquity. You will notice an increased lumbar lordosis and the limb length discrepancy will be obvious, some of them resulting in toe walking because they can no longer um, step down. I have not seen many ultrasounds of the hip being done, but it is an investigation that would be beneficial below the age of four months. And that, so um, this is an example of an ultrasound of the hip that is in. Just to orient you, this is the ilium, that is the acetabulum. This is the head of the femur. That is the labrum of the cetabulum, and obviously then that would be the capsule. And we expect that in a hip that is in, a line drawn along the ilium should bisect the head, similar to what we are seeing here. And the angles that can be measured, alpha and beta, to, to identify a dysplastic hip. But the more common thing that we tend to do is a, an X-ray. And what we'll be looking for are some lines, and I'll mention three of them here. We have the Shenton's line, which we identify even when you're talking about fracture neck or femur, it should be a nice smooth curve between the pubic uh, ramus, the superior one, and the lower aspect of the neck. We have the hilgen reiner's line, which runs across the two joints uh, uh, through the triradiate cartilage. And we have the Parkins line, which is a vertical line dropped from the lateral edge of the acetabulum. And in a hip that is reduced, that is where the head should be falling medial to the Parkins line and below the hill again rainers. But a hip that is dislocated, it will usually be lateral to the Parkins and superior to the hill again rainers. And we can go ahead and do a setup indices. So there's an acetabular line index, which is a line drawn from the triradial cartilage from the hill again rainers 
to the lateral edge of the acetabulum. And we expect that in a normal acetabulum, this should be less than 25 degrees. And if it is more than that, then we call that acetabulum dysplastic. There's a center edge, a center edge angle, which uh, can be measured, but we tend to do not do many of these because by the time we are doing the center edge angle, many of these children are beyond the point of us correcting by surgery. So um, in our situation, it may be a bit more academic than uh, therapeutic. Other investigation can be done is an arthrogram. It's commonly done after you have reduced a hip and you have to confirm that it is concentric because as we said, the head may not be very clearly visible, but if you have an arthrogram, then you can be able to see what you're doing. So how do we treat them? A child who is less than six months, many times the hip can be reduced. There is the question of double diapers that we have talked about in the past. Yes, double diapers will maintain some abduction, but unfortunately they have not been shown to be very effective. Carrying patients in the, carrying the babies in the back has treated patients who we didn't even know that had a, dis, a dislocation. But then what has been tried and tested is either using a public harness or a hip spiker. I do not have any experience with public harnesses and I know not many of us use them. And so I will focus my discussion on the hip spiker. If a child comes at an age where the hip is more likely to remain dislocated, so we are talking past six months and before one and a half years, then we can do a close reduction in theater, confirm with the CM or an arthrogram, and then put them in a hip spiker. The hip spiker should be put in a position of flexion of about 90 to 100 degrees, and it should be abducted to somewhere mid-abduction, somewhere around 45 degrees. We do the hip spiker um, for, for the first six weeks, change it at six weeks um, for another six weeks. So at a total duration of treatment is about three months. Many times we'll change from a hip spiker at six weeks to a bilateral abduction cast, which I will show in a short while. If they have failed uh, previously, if, if they have failed to do, if you have failed to reduce with a hip spiker, then we start thinking of surgery. If this child is above two years, and from your measurements, the acetabular index, you can see there's an acetabular dysplasia, then an acetabular osteotomy would also be beneficial. A femoral osteotomy is beneficial when you're having reduction, difficulties in maintaining reduction because of the tension that you're putting in the acetabulum, and also for correcting the excessive antiversion, and I'll be showing pictures of that. And so I'll briefly go through the technique of an open reduction of uh, what we have been doing and what I was doing in Kijabe when I was working there. The common incision we we'll do is a bikini incision, which is about a centimeter or, or two, just below the iliac crest and along running uh, parallel to the inguinal ligament. From that bikini incision, you can extend it uh, proximally so that you can expose the iliac crest. We go, through, the exposure beyond that is a Smith-Peterson, so we go between the sartorias and the tensor fascia lata, expose the um, uh, rectus femoris, which comes to insert just above the acetabulum and resect it, preferably target after that. Then we make a sharp incision through the apophysis, not what they have done here, but through the apophysis and reflect the tensor fascia lata uh, outwards and also reflect um, iliosoas and the, the attachments of the inner part of the acetabulum um, inwards. With that, we should be able to see the, hips cap the hip capsule. And in the hip capsule, we make a T incision, one line that runs along the neck and the other one that runs elliptically along the insertion of the capsule. Then with that T incision, we expose the hip inside. You will find that the ligamentum teres, you may not, it won't be appearing this way, but you'll be able to resect the ligamentum teres at the insertion on the hip, and then follow the ligamentum teres all the way down to identify the true acetabulum. If you don't follow it down, there are many times you can find yourself working on a false acetabulum. Once you get into the acetabulum, remove the pulvina that is there, and we also cut the transverse acetabular ligament to open up the hip some more. It may be necessary, if you remember what we said about the soft tissues, to also cut the insertion or release the insertion of the iliosoas uh, from 
the lesser trochanter. After that, you should be able to reduce the hip back in place. After reduction, if you need to do a shortening osteotomy or a derotating osteotomy of the femur, then it can be done and the osteotomy is secured. The closure after that involves um, what I think we used to call in general surgery double breasting. So the upper lip of the of the of the acetabulum of, of the capsule should be tucked as low as possible into the acetabulum, and then the lower lip should be tucked as high as possible. What we want to get rid of is the redundancy of this large capsule and at the same time use the capsule to reinforce our reduction. It may be necessary to do an osteotomy of the acetabulum or of the femur. If we need to do one of the femur, as I had mentioned, the reason is because we are getting rid of the excessive antiversion, also reducing the tension in the acetabulum because excessive tension will result in a vascular necrosis. If we need to do an acetabular osteotomy, there are very many different types of osteotomies that can be done. But one common one that we do in these children who are up to the age of eight, nine, can go all the way into early teenage, is the Salter osteotomy. And the Salter osteotomy is based on a, an osteotomy that is done supraacetabular to the lesser sciatic notch. And we shift the acetabulum down hoping, not hoping, but we expect it to hinge, uh, to hinge at the pubic symphysis. By doing that, we are able to reduce the acetabular index so that we can have a more, uh, better coverage at the top of the hip, at the top of the acetabulum. Many times, the gap that has been created will be able to pick a graft from the iliac crest, which is exposed, and come and jam it in here and hold it with K wires. The osteotomy should only be done once the hip has been reduced and you have seen that there's a concentric reduction. What do we do after that? The first thing we do is put, uh, after closure, we'll put them in a one and a half hip spiker for the first six weeks. We'll do a check x-ray immediately after surgery and at six weeks to confirm that the hip is still reduced. And after that, we'll also do, a, I mean, after that, we'll do a double cylinder cast to put them in abduction, but now start allowing flexion of the hip while maintaining abduction. This is done for another six weeks. At three months, we'll remove the casts and start physiotherapy and get them working. Um, many of them will have reduced and maintained and the reduction maintained at that time. How, what happens to these children over time? Generally, the prognosis is good. If you're able to reduce the hip, whether you did surgery or not, uh, many of them will remain in, with a caveat that if there was another underlying condition, as we mentioned, the neuromuscular conditions, then the chances of dislocation stand very high, even if you had very good reduction uh, intra-op. Early identification of these dislocated hips will usually help. There is an article, I was, is it an article or some website I was reading, and they were talking about a 74-year-old man who was discovered to have had a bilateral hip dislocation, I estimate it was a DDH, at the age of 74, and it was discovered after he died. So some of them will do even without our intervention. And so we have generally avoided doing surgeries if a child is beyond five years of age and they have bilateral dislocation or if a child is seven years of age and they have unilateral dislocation. And this is based on the success rate, that beyond that age, many of them will have a poor outcome. <laughs> Complications are based mainly on what treatment we do. If we don't do any treatment, an abnormal gait will be the biggest issue or early hip arthritis in those that have sublux. And some of you may have seen patients who present with this kind of acetabulum somewhere in their 40s. This may have been either adolescent or they may, adolescent uh, DDH, or something that was missed earlier, that it was a, a dysplastic acetabulum that just over time has worn out. If we do close reduction, let's be careful with public harnesses because of skin bruising. So it would be good to have frequent visits so that you teach the mothers how to take care of the harness. If you do a hip spiker, the biggest concern is pressure sores and the pressure sores are the margins, whether it is at the thigh or at the back. And if we have excessive abduction, 
then you could end up with a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. If we do surgery, the commonest problem we've had with them is infections at the surgical site. And the biggest reason is because we do surgery, close the wound, put them in casts, and you tell them, go home, see you in six weeks time. And some of them will come back with infections because when the problem started, they didn't note it. Other times our problem has been the K-wires either advancing too deep or the K-wire pulling back. And some parents have presented to the clinic holding the K-wire in one hand and the baby in another hand. Pin site infections are also, have also been a common problem. Whether if once the hip has been reduced, whether you had surgery or not, always watch out at around the age of 12 because they could either get a recurrence or they get a subluxation because of the growth spurt that happens in the early teenage. And so I go back to the slide that I had talked about earlier. And without showing the slide, I will ask these questions. Many of the patients, and I don't know what the experience has been for the rest of the orthopedic surgeons in this forum, many of the patients who present actually present at a walking age. And to me, that implies that this patient had a DDH that was most likely missed at the time of birth. Why is it that they are missed at the time of birth? We know many orthopedic conditions that are congenital are missed. We've had patients presenting with club feet and it was congenital, it was missed. We've had uh, tibia vara missed. It's not congenital, but developmental and it's missed. Is it because a lot of the, of the children are being delivered by midwives? Is it because there are a lot of home deliveries and I'm not saying home delivery is in this COVID era of you're getting pizza at home, people are delivering at home. Or is it because that the specialties that are getting trained are not being trained on congenital orthopedic conditions? And so my question to those who are uh, within the training programs or those who are tasked with the training of residents, whether orthopedic or not, is it time that we thought of orthopedic residents doing maternity rounds every morning? that we go and check that yesterday there were 10 babies delivered, let's go and do an examination on all of them and see whether any have club feet or any other thing that would be missing. Or is it time that we thought of the pediatric residents doing orthopedic rotations? Because we know that for any child that is delivered by a cesarean section in any of the big hospitals, there'll be a pediatrician there and the pediatrician will come and examine. And for us to avoid anything being missed, it did better that we have them we have the pediatrics residents rotate in ortho and find out these things. I will leave this as a challenge to those of us in training and those of us who are training. Thank you. Dr. Kilonzo, I'll take the uh, floor back to you. Floor, computer. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, Goku for your presentation. It was detailed enough. Um, I'm sure you can see the questions on the screen. Hello. Hello. Y yes, Dr. Kilonzo. Um, you want us to handle the questions? Hello. Hello. I can hear you, Dr. Kilonzo. You can see the questions on the screen? Yes. So yes. I think they're on the screen. We'll yeah. You can see the questions on the screen? Yes. So I'll start with the first question from uh, Dr. Stan Kinch. Um, I learned in an orthopedic department where I was trained to do hip ultrasound and clinical screening in all newborns. It worked, but I guess radiographers would need to be trained in the clinical examination as the ultrasound alone is not enough. Most cases in mild DDH are only advised to wrap very wide nappies in the, uh, in the babies, which is not really necessary in Kenya if you carry the babies on the back. And I agree with you, Dr. Kinch, only that uh, research seems to show that uh, the wide, the, the double diapers may not do the job as well as actually properly treating them. So um, I agree with you. Um, you have drawn a dega osteotomy but said it was a Salter Harris. Yes, Dr. Lutomia. The picture that I got, they were just talking about a pelvic osteotomy. But as, uh, but, uh, as I described, a Salta osteotomy, we start just suprastatabula and do a straight cut that does not breach the medial cortex 
of the, um, the medial cortex of the pelvis. And we use that to hinge down and improve the cover of the acetabulum or the superiorly. Now somebody has put a survey and now I can't see the questions. Um, let me Hello? Hello? Yeah, I was saying I was seeing a survey and not my questions. So let you me um, Dr. Lutomia is saying that he has never had needed to do an osteotomy as long as he skeletonized the proximal femur, find that it slides back as well. Um, that has been your experience. I have presented what has been our experience in Kijabe and what our experience has been for me here in Machakos. Dr. Theory, let's see the question. I've done a femoral shortening osteotomy quite often due to tension. I agree with him. I have regretted in a few patients that I have not done the femoral shortening osteotomy due to re-dislocation because of excessive soft tissue tension. Femoral osteotomy is also thought to decrease the incidence of AVN. I agree. Dr. Anjiko Njogo is asking, so does one decide between a redirectional pelvic osteotomy, e.g. SALTA? How does one decide between those? I will give this general answer. When dealing with the DDH or when dealing with any other any surgery where you find there are so many options that people are giving, you will find that there will be both positives and negatives <coughs> of one. A salta osteotomy has been known to work well between the ages of two and twelve. Our experience has been that the oldest children that we do um, corrective osteotomy, not not not. Um, not salvage osteotomies. Our experience has been that beyond the age of seven, the chances of re-dislocation are so high that many times we don't do surgeries beyond the age of seven. Now, since Salter osteotomy works very well between two and 12, we have perfected the art of doing the Salter osteotomy. And so if you are to go and talk to many of the surgeons who have either trained or worked in Kiwa Kijabe, or any of the surgeons that I've worked with in Machakos will not talk about the daggers and the others. So learn it well and have a good age limit where you know that you are no longer experimenting on a patient, but you're doing something that will actually benefit the patient. Neonatal screening collaboration with the pediatricians as they are the ones who are mostly in the neonatal examination. Is it more common in primary babies as I had mentioned? it is more common in a first time pregnancy because of uh, an unstretched uterus. Um, Saeed Omar Ahmed is asking, for newborns presenting with a positive ballo and otolani and no expertise in ultrasound, shall we observe for two to four weeks and reassess clinically and start bracing? No, treatment should start once we have found that they have a positive ballo and otolani we do not necessarily need an ultrasound to diagnose something that we've already diagnosed clinically. So a clinical examination is already diagnosed enough and so treatment should start. Um, what is the rate of total hip in operate? What is the rate of a total hip replacement in operated and also in unoperated DDH rate later in life? Have you been left with a permanent limb length discrepancy in patients who had a femoral osteotomy? Let me address the second question first. After a femoral osteotomy, yes, it looks like we have taken out a chunk of femur, sometimes even up to two centimeters, but no, we are not left with any permanent limb because of a limb length discrepancy. Remember, these are children. And let's go back to the basics. If you have a child presenting with a fracture femur, we are allowed up to two centimeters of shortening when they are in a hip spiker, and we know that that will correct. So if that happens normally with a fracture femur, how much more with this fracture femur that you have caused and fixed? So no, they tend to correct the limp length discrepancy. We don't end up with any problem with that. What is the rate? I don't know what the rate is, but we have done quite a number of patients uh, total hip replacements because of, I will not say DDH that we know it started in childhood. All we just know is that the acetabulum was definitely dysplastic and we have had to many times do what we'll call a complex primary totally because you no longer have the normal acetabulum so you either have end up reinforcing it superiorly 
or uh, having to rim a bit more so that you can get more coverage of the acetabular cup or shell, depending on what you're putting. Yeah, but I don't know what the rate is because we, we've not followed anybody for 40, 50 years. Um, Stan King, which hospitals or surgeons are experienced enough to solve enough to salter or femur varies osteotomies in the country, i.e. where can we refer those patients? I'm too scared to do that operation myself. A surgeon who has experience in pediatric orthopedics, and the good thing is that now we are having doctors training in ped ortho. I think Cure has a program that is training pediatric orthopedics. So I would either send them to Cure or a doctor who has had experience in pediatric orthopedics. The truth is this. DTH is not a, one of those that uh, you'll say, I've come straight from my residency and now I can fix it. After my residency, I still had to train under uh, uh, two of my seniors for about two years before I could do a DTH on my own. The steps look very simple when explained, but when it comes to doing, as we have all realized, uh, patients don't look like their textbook. Things are usually a bit different. And so I'll say instead of experimenting on these patients, just send them to somebody who has a bit more experience or a place where they can be, they can get better care. Um, Dr. Musevi agrees with us that most of the patients he has treated uh, have come walking. So yes, we need to have more awareness earlier. Um, I'm looking for the questions, thanks, Dr. Terry. What is your usual plan for those neglected over 12 years? As I mentioned, beyond the age of five years, if the patient is, has bilateral, we do nothing. Beyond the age of seven years, if the patient has unilateral, do nothing. When do you decide on arthroplasty? When the patient has symptoms that necessitate arthroplasty. They have pain, they have deformity, they have features of arthritis on the X-ray, and they can no longer tolerate the medications we are giving them. I think that's the last question I see for now. So Dr. Kilonzo, I can hand over back the, the, the chair, the, the screen to you so that we can have our sponsors have a word. Thank you very much, Dr. Nguko. For the presentation. I'm sure we can read all the comments that are coming up. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nguko, for the presentation taking your time to prepare. You can see the comments are still coming. I think you shall keep reading them. If you have got any issue, you can raise it with Dr. Nguku.